afternoon everyone and welcome to today's uh, virtual president's visit for the northwest and east midlands um, entitled delivering garden villages for the 21st century my name is ian gilbert and i'm the uh, this year's chair of the rtpi northwest region um, in my day job i'm a planning director for barton wilmore in our manchester team i've got a keen interest in uh, progress of garden villages and the role that planning and planners play in their delivery we've got four of the 14 uh, government supported garden village programs within the northwest and our team in manchester uh, has interacted with uh, with all of those projects uh, on an on ongoing basis and we've worked with both of the uh, guest speakers here today um, in terms of the content of today's webinar most of you will know that each year the president of the rtpi visits the region and would normally spend the day visiting places and projects which showcase the region but also fit closely with the president's agenda for the a year in position this year is a little different insofar as the president's visits are necessarily virtual, but the approach is still the same. This year's president, Wei Yang, is, renowned, is a renowned town planner and urban designer with considerable wealth experience in both new communities and urban regeneration. Wei is a lead figure in researching, promoting and implementing the 21st century garden city approach. In 2017, the then Housing and Planning uh, Minister, Gavin Barwell, launched the government's programme for the first ever government funded garden villages. The villages were expected to have the potential to deliver 48,000 new homes across England uh, across projects between 1,500 and 10,000 homes. The government's programme included 14 proposed new garden villages with initial access to £6 million worth of funding in the first two years to aid delivery. In addition to the funding, the government proposed to offer support, expertise, brokerage and offer new planning freedoms. Four and a half years on from that announcement, those projects have proceeded at varying paces and, with their own and met their own challenges with lessons for the whole planning industry to, to learn. I look forward to hearing from our guest speakers today as they provide their own personal experiences uh, in promoting garden village projects and we welcome their insights. In terms of the format today, we've got some housekeeping uh, points to help you get the most out of our session. As attendees, you've all been muted by the organiser. If you have any questions for our speakers or, or for um, our organisers, then please send them via the question link in the GoToWebinar panel, which should be on the right or the top of your screen. We're encouraging questions as part of, this, as part of this visit, and we want to make the most out of having our speakers here today. If you'd like your name to be read out uh, with the question, please include that within. Uh, please include your name and where you're from in your question. Uh, the speakers' uh, presentations will run for approximately 30 minutes. That's 15 minutes per speaker, um, and then it'll be followed by a question and answer um, panel discussion, um, and then some summary thoughts from our presence wrap things up. Um, each of our speakers will pass you on to the next, so you don't have to keep hearing from me. Um, our um, question and answer session will be led by Ryan Walker, who is the uh, RTPI Young Planner of the Year for 2021 and Vice Chair of the UK-wide Young Planners Network. Ryan's a planning consultant currently working with the Paul Hogarth Company and deliver in delivering transformative or transformative <laughs> projects across the UK and Ireland. Uh, the, uh, the question and answer sessions will have all of us from the webinar on it. We'll try and pick up all the questions submitted. Where that's not possible, we'll be inviting our speakers uh, to consider any further questions after the session, and we can email lo those answers out. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and available on the RTPI YouTube channel after the event, and handouts should be in your handout window um, within the uh, GoToWebinar. Um, if you lose connection uh, during the session, please try rejoining by the link that you're emailed. Um, and uh, if the speakers lose connectivity then please wait uh, please wait in the webinar and, and keep an eye on your emails in case we have to relaunch the session but we're not expecting that to happen so anyway without uh, further ado i'll introduce our speakers today um our first speaker jane meek uh, leads on carlisle's ambitious economic and housing growth agenda as carlisle's corporate, de uh, corporate director for economic development she's focused on delivering jobs and growth in carlisle uh, through the development and implementation of a new local plan and led the successful application of garden village status for Carlisle South. Jane has presented with me in previous RTPI CPD sessions and has a fascinating insight into the practicalities and nuances of driving such an ambitious, ambitious project through the planning system. Our second speaker is Karen Johnson, who is the planning policy manager at Bassett Law District Council, uh, leading the Bassett Law local plan preparation and regeneration plans for works op town centre. Those plans include emerging proposals to create a new garden village um, in the area to help meet the long-term needs of the district. 
Karen has been working in the planning industry for over 20 years, uh, in which time has built up an extensive knowledge of strategic planning, planning policy, specialising in major uh, residential and employment infrastructure projects. Um, I've worked with Karen and her colleagues in promoting two major development projects within Bassett Law. Um, uh, and I can testify to Karen's breadth of experience in planning for such diverse district and look forward to hearing from her today. So if I can now pass on to Jane, who will present her presentation of Delivering Garden Villages in Carlisle. Thanks, Ian, and thank you for that introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. And it's really good to be able to have this opportunity to talk to you about uh, St Cuthbert's Garden Village in Carlisle. Some of you will have heard me speak about it before, uh, but we are beginning to get to move it really forward now. So it's good to come and give you an update today. And uh, please uh, don't think I am presenting this from the bottom of the sea. For some reason, my laptop does not like uh, this webinar. Uh, and, for, and I have, that's the reason why I have a green tinge. I'm not really green in real life, for those of you who know me. So, for those of you who uh, don't know me, I am the Corporate Director for Economic Growth at Carlisle City and I am the Lead Officer uh, on, the, on a number of initiatives and projects which are happening across our region and city to help do deliver economic growth and that includes the Borderlands Growth Deal, uh, the Towns Deal, uh, Future High Street Fund and St Cuthbert's Garden Village, which is what I'm going to focus on today. St Cuthbert's is so important to the economy uh, of Carlisle and the broader region. Uh, and what I'm going to set out is our, uh, the strategic background, uh, the work and, that we've done so far, and the challenges around delivering a garden village. So next slide, please, Joanne. As you can see, I put this, I use this on a regular basis as presentations, because I think it's always useful to just remind ourselves as to where Carlisle is. It's right on the uh, Scottish border, uh, north of the Lake District, um, um, northern Cumbria. It's the only city in Cumbria. It is the only city in the Borderlands region, which includes uh, authorities north of the border, uh, Scottish borders, Dumfries and Galloway, as well as Northumberland and ourselves. So it is a really important city. It is well located um, or in that area and it has good strategic networks um, so it includes the M6 West Coast Main Line which run through the area and they provide strategic links to London, Edinburgh, Glasgow, uh, Newcastle, Manchester as well as man international links through Manchester Airport. Uh, it has an important role to play as the only city in Cumbria and the Borderlands region and has a catchment area of nearly half a million. Cumbria and the wider region are facing a number of challenges, in particular a declining working age population, which when coupled with an increasing retirement age population means that we have a high age, old, high old age dependency. And a number of years ago, as Ian said in his introduction, the City Council set an ambitious economic growth uh, strategy as a key priority, and St Cuthbert's Garden Village is a fundamental part of that growth strategy. Next slide, please. So Cuthbert's Garden Village was identified in the Carlisle Local Plan as a major uh, mixed-use development of over 10,000 new homes, new business space and associated, associated infrastructure, including schools, community and health facilities and green and blue infrastructure. In 2017, we applied to be part of the Garden Village programme, really as a way of uh, bringing Carlisle to the attention of government and raising the profile of the city. And we were really surprised, but pleased to be accepted on the Garden Village programme. This has enabled us to properly plan the village and focus on the creation of communities and how those communities will live in the future, rather than just being a suburban housing expansion, expansion of Carlisle. So as it said there on that slide, mixed use development of over 10,000 homes and part of the adopted strategy, but also as I referenced earlier, very central to the economic ambitions of Cumbria and the borderlands. Uh, it also enabled us uh, to apply for HIF funding, uh, so Housing Infrastructure Fund, many of you will be aware of this and, and will have been through the trials and tribulations of applying for that, um, for that funding, which is really challenging. But last year we got £134 million from Homes England to, live, to deliver that uh, last part of the Ring Road round Carlisle. 
so that's southern relief road so really uh really positive and as i said positive planning focus on the development of communities next slide please so we set out on our stage one uh, master planning process, which involved a number, as you can imagine, a number of workshops, consultation with the people, with local people, etc., to actually develop our vision. The vision which emerged out of the stage one master planning process um, talks about the context of the garden village and the wonderful landscapes and heritage of the area but it particularly talks about the development of communities and quality homes and that it will be actively promote healthy living as one of my councillors said and he says this on a regular basis that everyone who lives in car in st cuthbert's garden village should be naturally healthy and i think that's become particularly important for a, a garden village of the future and following on for the last 18 months next slide please the vision is underpinned by the nine guiding principles. The first, the first of which is start with the park, illustrating the point that this is more than just about housing. Other principles include local distinctive quality homes, smart and sustainable living, integrated sustainable transport, and innovative employment opportunities. All the things that we as planners would expect to see uh, in a garden village, but also very important in terms of delivering that, that approach. Next slide, please. This plan shows, as you can see, you can see the, this is basically St. Cuthbert's Garden Village is located uh, on the southern edge of the, of the city, of the built-up area. And that, this uh, plan shows how those principles that were established in the stage one master planning were translated into spatial and physical terms with the green and blue infrastructure extending like fingers into the city and linking up with other green infrastructure that we have uh, within the city centre. It also shows the Southern Relief Road for which we got the HIF funding. So you can see it links, you can see the M6, um, hopefully, uh, and we will show you slides this, the M6 uh, on the eastern side or the right hand side of your screen, which then junction 42 on the M6 links round to the A595. So not only does it provide a spine road for the garden village, it also provides strategic links around the west coast of Cumbria. So very important economically, as well as supporting the garden village. Next slide, please. The next stage was to develop the concept framework further. And that meant go, going into more detail and understanding what would actually make up the garden village what how many schools what infrastructure was required uh, and how we would actually start to map out uh, and where development would happen so next slide please in addition to the public engagement we also put together an extra uh, panel made up of representatives from a range of disciplines including health social housing landscape architects transport and in particular experts in sustainability and some heart living and this expert panel and i would recommend this to any of you who are getting involved in a garden village was so important because it really they they acted as critical friends and really tested the ideas that we'd started to bring together at stage one and so it was really really um really uh helpful uh in addition also communicating with our communities that public engagement and ensuring that we were keeping our communities involved in any, every step uh, of the process and what emerged out of uh, the uh, out of the stage one and stage two master planning was three concepts three specific options meant, mentioned there compact communities connected communities and edge communities and out of that uh, came the a blend of those so next stage next slide please so this is the plan we're currently working on on the illustrative master plan for that will form the basis of our local plan which we are in the process of developing now uh, specific for St Cuthbert's Garden Village so as you can see, you can see where the bulks have got some development on the edge of the city, which link into, uh, in, into uh, the, uh, the development, the housing development, we're already there. But the main focus is on that center where the, where the, uh, the bulk of the development will actually happen. Uh, and, it's, uh, and the new village will be uh, linked by good infrastructure. Next slide, please. 
This slide uh, provides a summary of what the garden village will be made uh, made up of. So you can see we're beginning to, to, to pad out those concepts that we talked about earlier. So we know now the number of schools, uh, the Sun the Relief Road uh, mentioned there, uh, I mentioned already 2000 homes by 2030. So it sets that ambition in terms of delivering homes early, uh, which is absolutely essential to the government's agenda. Uh, employment, social infrastructure and local centres and all the things that you would expect as planners to see within the garden village. So we're now moving into the delivery uh, stage uh, and from that, from the local authority point of view, this means sorting out the building blocks like the local plan and the design code. Uh, so next, next slide please. The challenge is of course delivering a garden village uh, and particularly uh, it being a garden village and picking up all the vision and principles that I set out earlier. We are a small, uh, a relatively small uh, district authority um, and one of the big challenges is actually resources and we've received over well, one and a half million pounds of capacity funding from the government and that's been absolutely essential in helping us to go through the stage one and stage two master planning processes and really uh, do some excellent master planning, proper planning uh, it's not often as planners we get the opportunity to to start planning a town from scratch and, and it's been a great uh, experience being involved in this but the capacity funding has been essential to us as a local authority as a reference already infrastructure costs are a huge issue for us so the HIF uh, is 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 vital the HIF funding has been vital to help put in that spine road uh, viability and one of the key issues uh, for us is how do you actually afford to pay for the infrastructure for the schools, uh, for the community facilities, uh, particularly when you are a city um, it, like us in the north whereby there isn't a huge amount of value in the land that we can capture to order to provide those uh, facilities necessary for a garden village and that's something that we are working really hard on at the moment. One of the issues always is with these things is politics and we have helped to deal with that matter by having cross-party support so we very early on in our local plan process set up a cross-party working group uh, to enable all members of all parties to be engaged in the uh, the development of the local plan and that as a, uh, the local plan and the garden village which has been really effective and then in particular public engagement um, we're just in the process of, uh, well, la uh, last week, we um, the CPO inquiry for the HIF was held and there have been no objections to the CPO. Um, the, there was one outstanding objection which, with, which was withdrawn, which is quite amazing really, that we have had no objections to the CPO, CPO for, the, um, for the road, for the link road. So, and that has been because we've engaged with the public and we have throughout all the processes, whether or not it's going into schools or talking to parish councils or just general community engagement. Next slide, please. So the next steps for us are the CSLR, which is the uh, Southern Relief Road, uh, delivering on, on that, uh, getting the local plan sorted, well, our design SPD for the um, map for the the garden has now been approved by council um, so we're well on way with that and our local plan for St Cuthbert's Garden Village we are in the process of putting together that together doing all the evidence base with a view that we will have the public inquiry towards the end of next year as I said capacity funding is absolutely fundamental uh, and we've just received another tranche of capacity funding to help us into the next stage but also very key is the development corporation funding. So we applied at the end of last year to be part of the government's initiative in terms of exploring the uh, establishing development corporation and what, what that would mean. And it's just been announced that we've received 745,000 to deliver that and to work on that. So we're really at an exciting stage uh, and, you know, and I look forward to being able to sort of move this on to the next steps. So thank you for listening uh, to me. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, and I'll now pass over to Karen.
Lovely. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, so as, as Ian um, said at the beginning, uh, I'm, I'm Karen Johnson, for those of you that haven't met me before, and I am the, the Planning Policy Manager at Bassett Law District Council. Um, and Bassett Law is, is a district that is full of uh, fantastic um, planning challenges and opportunities. As a planner, it's, it's a unique place to work. There's so many different um, opportunities that um, exist there, many of which we're trying to address through the Emerging Local Plan. Um, and that does include um, an opportunity for a new garden village. Um, so, so we're currently 10 weeks away from, from publication. Uh, so we're at a slightly earlier step in the process of the local plan and the garden village to, to Carlisle, but hopefully that gives you a, a slightly different um, perspective on, on garden village development. So next slide, please. Thank you. So for those of you that don't know Bassett Law, um, we're a mostly rural district in North Nottinghamshire, so we're just, just south of South Yorkshire. Uh, we're 80% rural and we've got three main towns, so Worksop, Retford and Haworth and Burcoats. Historically, Bassett Law has been known as being a, a mining area, um, power generation. We've had three power stations that have closed relatively recently in the last 10 years or so. One is just winding down now. Um, and very much around industry and that sort of thing. So one of the key drivers for this local plan um, is, is to deliver a step change in the economy. So um, we're very much uh, focused on, on certain types of industry and we don't want to be overly reliant on, on one sector or two sectors. And we also want to see um, residents be upskilled, uh, introduce more better paid jobs. Um, and to reduce the amount of out commuting that we see for those jobs. Um, a lot of people live in the district, but actually work in, in South Yorkshire in those better paid jobs. And we want to retain that, that skill set within the district and attract those, those jobs in. Very much like Carlisle, we also want to build on our locational advantage. So uh, we're very fortunate that the A1 um, runs right the way through the district, north south, and uh, connecting us to, to York and, and, and obviously down to London. Uh, and then east west we have the A57 which which connects us to Sheffield and Lincoln. We've also got the railway line which follows exactly the same path um, east west and the east coast main line as well which has a, a station at Retford. So so really the district is about an hour and 40 minutes from London so it's it's highly accessible. Worksop itself is about 20 minutes or so from the M1 and um, the district is probably about half an hour tops from from Doncaster Airport as well. So in terms of accessibility it's ideally placed. Um, and we want to bring those benefits to the district. Um, so um, the majority of growth in the local plan is very much focused around the three main towns, which, which works really well for us at the time we're at now. It's very much around um, site allocations as infill and then urban extensions at Worksop and Retford. But with one eye on the future, uh, we want to sort of future proof our towns. We don't want them to lose their character. We don't want to uh, develop too much of, of the countryside for which um, Bassett Law is attractive. So um, a garden village provides a really good opportunity to, to introduce a different offer into the district in terms of the type of housing and the types of employment that would, would go there. But it also helps us future proof the character and distinctiveness of the towns that we've already got. So we very much see the garden village as being a, a long term sustainable growth option. Um, very much like Carlisle, it will be delivered over two plan periods. So we see um, potentially 500 homes uh, coming online towards the very end of our plan period from about 2032. Um, but the majority of the development being after um, the end of this plan period. So it's about putting the marker in the sand in this plan uh, and setting out the principles for how we see the, the settlement uh, being designed and how it should develop. Um, and I think that that's the, that's the key thing. It's about bringing a different type of offer into the district. So it's very much about quality. It's very much about additionality. That's not to say that our other sites don't do that, but it's just about providing a very different sort of offer. We're very much around promoting exemplar development. And it's also about having that lifestyle choice for anybody that wishes to live and work there. So um, as I'll come across, up on in, in the, the next few slides. It's about the, the type of lifestyle you can have that you would buy into if you chose to live or work at the Garden Village. Um, so, and it's it's very much about bringing that legacy uh, for the future, not just for the, the residents and the businesses that would locate on the Garden Village, but it's also about the legacy for the district as a whole. So it's about quality of place, 
not only um, at the design stage, but in the development and then in the long term management as well. We want to make sure that that quality doesn't just isn't just there in the beginning, but actually it runs through the development and it stays in the long term. Uh, next slide, please. So the the red line on the on the on the slide there that is that is the Garden Village site. So um, and the green uh, roads that sort of run along the western boundary that is very much the A1. So um, in terms of uh, locational advantage, it's it's ideally placed. It's on the A1 A57 junction, the A57 running west. Um, and the uh, Sheffield to Lincoln railway line uh, is the northern boundary. So it runs along that that red line at the top there. Um, and one of the things that is very attractive by this site is that um, there is an opportunity to uh, introduce a, a railway station on site. Historically, there was a station on the site um, and has been lost for some time now, um, but there is an opportunity to reintroduce that. And we do have in principle support from, from Network Rail and uh, Northern Rail for, for, for that um, infrastructure to be introduced which is one of the key attractions of this site is about introducing meaningful infrastructure that can make a difference not only to the, the garden village but more widely in the district as well um, because of its location um, it does have a significant shop window if you like for business particularly for business growth um, one of the things that we want to introduce on this site is not just um, the logistics type warehousing and that manufacturing that the district is known for um, along the A1 and the A57 corridors. It's about bringing in some of those growth sector opportunities. Um, D2N2, we're working very closely with, with our LEP on this and they see this site as being key to introducing those growth sectors to the district around you know creative and digital uh, modern methods of construction all of those kind of the green energy sector as well all of those sectors that will bring those higher skill better paid jobs to the area um, the site is um, very much equidistant between Worksop and Retford it's about 15 minutes each way um, and it's employment areas and it is surrounded by a predominantly rural area so there's some fantastic opportunities to integrate the site within that sort of structure particularly with the rural area and introduce some facilities that will help support our rural communities moving forward because like many parts of the country uh, accessibility might not be as, as strong in the rural area and some of the facilities may not be as um, as prevalent so this is an opportunity to have that sort of central focal point if we can get the links in then that very much um, better integrates the rural community um, with a wider range of services and facilities than currently exists one of the key attractions from a planning point of view for this site is that it's um, it's relatively constraint free. So for a 216 hectare site, um, that, that's quite unusual. Um, all that the constraints can be can be mitigated and can be managed. So the, the green area that you see sort of to the um, the southwest there, that's the Clumber Park Triple um, SI. Uh, and there is uh, we are working very closely with Natural England to make sure that the proximity of another 4,000 homes doesn't have any adverse recreational impacts on Clumber. And so one of the opportunities we do have on this site is to introduce a, a suitable alternative natural green space as a means of providing an alternative um, recreational space for residents. But it also helps us carefully manage um, increased visitor numbers as well to Clumber. So there is a, a potential benefit there to the visitor economy in the long term. Um, and as I've said, there is that potential for significant infrastructure, which we may not be able to do on some of our other sites. Um, there is the railway station. There is also the opportunity to bring in um, a, a bus station, a bus interchange as well. And because we do have that, that strong link with the A1 and the A57, it's around thinking about um, electric vehicle, alternative fuel vehicle charging in the future as well, and having maybe a hub adjacent to, to the A1 where, where that kind of support can be offered again trying to bring something different into the district and providing another justification for this site in this particular location um, and by, by all of those things come together very nicely to um, to provide that sort of legacy for the community in the long term particularly um, the existing community very much like Carlisle um, we have done a lot of work with our, our community in terms of engagement to get them to understand the, how a garden village works, why it is different to other sites that we are looking at taking forward through the local plan and the benefits that it, it can bring to them. And, and that certainly the, the comments and the feedback we've had through the local plan process uh, highlights that. 
can I have the next slide, please? So the approach that we've taken um, was very much that we, the starting point for us was around the uh, TTPA's Garden City principles. They were kind of like our baseline, but we were very keen that they um, were locally distinctive and they were very reflective of Bassett Law as a place. We didn't want it to be another housing uh, settlement, um, or a new settlement. We wanted it to be very distinctive and have that quality. So we've um, translated those sort of TTPA principles into six locally distinctive principles, which I'll, I'll go on to talk about in a minute. Um, the, the key thing for us was through the local plan to have that really strong policy framework. So not just in terms of the allocation itself and what the, the sort of the, the, the general requirements would be, but about having a, a design framework that's embedded in policy. And um, that was really important, not just for ourselves as the local planning authority to make sure that we could have some influence over the way the design evolved in the future to maintain that quality that is, is a key driver for this site. But also from the landowner's perspective as well, they very much wanted that confidence that um, what they were signing up to about effectively would be delivered in the long term. This is very much like a 30 year plan. So we do need to have that um, policy framework in place now. Albeit that we only see say 500 homes coming forward in this plan period, it's about having that sort of confidence that the principles that we're talking about today will still be realized in you know 25 years time um so um in terms of um deliverability we've got some very um similar issues to carlisle um, and we've taken similar steps um we also have felt that having that collective buy-in early on was very very important in terms of taking the garden village forward and being able to demonstrate ultimately to an inspector examination that uh, the garden village is deliverable and it is achievable um, because we too do have um, land values that aren't as favourable as other parts of the country. So we set up quite early on um, a governance structure that has a, a stakeholder group, a stakeholder board, and that is about 20 organisations, partner organisations, uh, the representatives are at that strategic level so they can influence the funding streams and the, and the, the planning side at, at their organisations. Um, and then we also within that, there's, there's a technical group that, that feed into that. And then we also have a, a parish council uh, panel as well that, that feeds into that process. Um, so the area is parished um, and it's very important that the directly affected parish councils do have that input and that uh, and provide that local knowledge and understanding of, of of drainage and of the way the road networks work and all of that kind of thing. And it's important that they have a say because it will affect the way that their parishes um, work in the future. So we, we've, we have that as a separate sort of strand, but we also do a lot of work and consultation through the local plan process. And as I said, we, we have had, um, slowly we are building that confidence in the scheme. And I think a lot of residents and businesses can see why. Um, a garden village is a, a, a fantastic opportunity and uh, not, not only for in terms of maybe taking some housing sites away from their patch, but also in terms of what it can mean uh, as a legacy for the district and how it is a bit of a game changer in terms of the way people think about Bassett Law. Um, unlike, unlike Carlisle, we don't, I don't think we have quite as many landowners involved. We, we, we have two, which, which is quite a, a benefit to us in that we're, we're dealing with, with two landowners who have a collective vision they've um they very much support the vision that the council went to them with and they've been very clear that that is the vision that they wish to take forward um, and we've had that we've worked with them over a, a number of, well 18 months now to to get that confidence to the point that we're at that they're now working together and that they're very much um supportive of the local plan and the policy framework and the initial concept plan as well um, so in terms of the principles they've had quite a lot of involvement in the way the principles have come to be and um, and they sit on the stakeholder group as well. So they do have that, that sort of day-to-day -day involvement as well. One of the key concerns for us is how we, we do capture that land value um, as land values will increase and change as, as the garden village becomes established. It's about how we can capture that and then have it reinvested into the later stages of the garden village uh, delivery and how we demonstrate that to an inspector uh, examination. Um, there does seem potentially there is a, a bit of a challenge there in terms of having the right evidence to convince an inspector of the deliverability of a garden village and what national policy is asking us to do. Um, so that's something that we're working very hard on at the moment. 
Uh, next slide, please. So, so this is just a, a quick uh, a quick slide as you can see the extent of our partners and I think it pretty much covers all of um, not just the statutories but we've got um, environmental partners, healthcare, uh, we've got the D22 LEP in there as well, um, all of the uh, utility companies and, um, and organisations like the Wildlife Trust and the Woodland Trust as well who are very important that uh, for the landowners that they were involved that was one of the key principles um, from their point of view is the environmental quality so, so those partners are, are very key to our uh, delivery plan. Next slide, please. So just to sort of sum up the, the draft allocation then, uh, it's 4,000 homes with about 500 um, in this plan period to 2037. We're looking at 15 hectares of, of business land um, and then five hectares of commercial space potentially around the, um, the A1, A57 junction in the form of like a commercial sort of service station type opportunity and then there is all of the supporting infrastructure you would expect with a new settlement so that will include over time a primary school health hub and then the transport infrastructure as well uh, next slide please so we've identified through the stakeholder group uh, six key principles uh, to deliver the garden village um, healthy active place making it was top of the agenda um, it's something that I, I'm very passionate about um, as a planner, um, but it's something that which is something that we're trying to weave in to, to the local plan uh, throughout its um, its policies. But it's very much uh, based on the the principles in uh, Sport England's um, active design and also the World Health, Health Organization's uh, principles as well. Uh, very much around the design of the garden villages around the 15 minute neighbourhoods. So the idea is is that wherever you are on the on the settlement, you would be able to walk, cycle or get a bus to go do your everyday local shops and services. So you don't have to get in a car to go buy a pint of milk. It's very much about um, not being car dependent once you are in the garden village. And then moving on to the second principle, it's also about having those fantastic physical connections out of the site as well to reduce that car dependency to, to Workshop and Retford in particular, but also to, to the sub-region as well, particularly with the, the, uh, the railway station, the train line. It's about introducing the, that cycling connectivity as well. That's um, a, a key passion for the council is to enhance um, cycling uh, and active travel as a way of moving around the district to try and take some of the cars off the road. And again, it's making sure that all of those routes are in place uh, so that people have a choice as to what they can do uh, rather than being car dependent. So we know that's one of the challenges that comes through um, the local plan process is that garden villages have have got the perception that there's car dependency early on and we want to try and break that that trend with Bassett Law. Um, we have got the support of our commercial uh, bus operator to have a, a bus service on site as early as is technically feasible to do so um, and that's one way of us making sure that there is an alternative there to the car um, to Workshop and Retford from as early a stage as possible and again that does then provide that link for the rural community as well to get them into the site to use the, the shops and services that may well exist on, on the garden village. If I could have the next slide please. So sustainability is very much at the heart of what we're doing particularly as it's a 30-year plan it needs to be future-proofed um, so it's um, sustainable design and construction uh, to, to whatever the, the standards are as, as we move forward. Um, and it's about embedding those um, the right technologies in place uh, in terms of renewables and, and zero carbon. Because we're planning from scratch as well, it's an agricultural uh, it's agricultural land at the moment. There's some fantastic opportunities to build that in from the outset, very much around community energy schemes, um, air source heat, or heat pumps, and also because we've got uh, quite an extensive area of employment land on site as well, it's about making use of those roof spaces and having PV on site as well but also making sure that the policies are flexible enough to accommodate changing technologies as, as the, the site starts to emerge and how we can capture whatever is the most efficient technologies as we move forward. Um, one of the key drivers for this site um, is um, sort of replicating elements of Sherwood Forest. So for, for those of you that aren't aware, uh, the northern part of Sherwood Forest actually sits within Bassett Law. Um, and one of the key, council's key aspirations is to have uh, more tree, tree canopy cover across the district. Um, fortunately for us, that's something that the landowners wholeheartedly support. And so there's a really key emphasis on uh, tree canopy cover and biodiversity net gain 
and having the right species in place to be able to manage uh, carbon resilience and deliver that carbon resilience in the future. In terms of innovation, it's important that the garden village is, is digitally connected with whatever is the, the, the most up-to-date and um, efficient technologies at the time. And we would very much see this as being a, an opportunity again in terms of showcasing uh, modern methods of construction, you know, modular homes, whatever the technologies and the opportunities are in the future. And having the, the businesses on site, but having opportunities to pilot those schemes as well. And we do have links with uh, local universities as well. So it's about building in that reflective practice and making sure, again, that we can capture new ideas as they're coming online and help build that into the, um, the master planning for the site. Next slide, please. So community is, is very much at the heart of what we're wanting to do. And, and that has been uh, demonstrated so far through the locally led vision and the ongoing engagement we have with our communities on the, the planning side. In terms of looking to the future, it's very much about having the new community um, involved in the long term management and stewardship of, of public assets, whether that's through uh, community rangers or um, having a community interest um, trust set up to, to sort of manage those facilities. And, and of course, it's, it's making sure that the, the existing community has access to those facilities and feels part of the, the new settlement. And as with anything um, in terms of delivering the Garden City principles, it's about making sure that the design is of the best quality and is distinctive to place. Um, we would be expecting a design code to be produced for this site that is very much reflective of, of Bassett law, but also of uh, you know, new, new design and new technologies as they come forward. Um, integrated with the landscape um, in terms of, as I've said, that the, the history in terms of Sherwood Forest, uh, there is some distinctive features on site in terms of woodland and, um, and, and more wilder areas, and we'd like to see those retained. Um, and a key uh, theme for us very much from the outset was that green infrastructure would play a significant part in, in the design of the garden village, and that should be the basis from which development would be built around. Uh, so 40% of the site will be green blue infrastructure um, and a lot of that will then be tree canopy cover as well. And obviously a, a quality place should mean that it's got homes for everybody irrespective of affordability um, and age and, and, and your position in life as well. So it will have the full range of homes available there. Um, affordable housing where we're looking at 20% currently. Um, and also 20% of homes should be for um, older people as well with, with extra care and dementia friendly design built in as well because in Bassett Law we do have a, 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 an aging population, one is aging quite strongly and we do need to be mindful of that with this being a 30 year plan. And as I said, diverse employment opportunities is very much the driver for the garden village uh, in this plan period and it's about making sure we've got the right conditions in place to attract those businesses to the area. Uh, next slide, please. So, so this is very much our initial concept plan um, that we are hoping to adopt um, in, in the autumn. Uh, I, I won't go into too much detail, but essentially we've got three hubs on the site there. Uh, a central one, which is the community hub, which will have the school and, and that kind of um, those kind of facilities. The one on the northern boundary, number one, is, is very much the, the transport hub, which is where the railway station and the bus interchange will be. And then hub three, which is to the sort of north east, is very much a, more of a recreational hub. Um, and all of that is connected by walking and cycling routes. Um, and then we've got the, the area number four near the, um, the junction, which is very much around that commercial, co commerciality with employment looking to be housed more or less along the A1 corridor, though not exclusively. Um, uh, next slide, please. So in terms of next steps from our side of things, um, we are, they're slightly in the wrong order, but uh, I, I've got those a little bit, uh, a little bit the wrong way around. We are looking to go to publication with the local plan um, in August, uh, so, so in, in the near future. Um, and we're, we're very much hoping that the local plan will be adopted um, by the end of next year. Um, following on from that, uh, from publication, we have a vision statement and that will be taken to our council, hopefully in September for that their endorsement. Um, and that will include the concept plan that you've just seen. And that will very much set the, the benchmark then for um, a developer partner 
to, to come on board and to to take things forward so we very much see that this is almost like the end of the, the council sort of lead on this we would still need to be involved as a local planning authority but we very much see that the, the master planning then would be taken forward by developer partners and we're looking to work with the landowners to sort of get that in place um, as soon as is, is possible um, with the master plan framework ideally um, up and running by, by 2025 so that we can start looking at leading times for, for delivery uh, which we're hoping will be towards the end of the plan period um, in around 2032. Uh, thank you very much uh, for listening and I'm happy to take questions um, but I, I understand I need to hand over to Ryan now. Hi everybody um, and thanks Karen there for that handover and for a very interesting presentation as well too. Um, I should probably say at this stage that I do have a bit of a vested interest in garden villages, um, having been born and raised in Northern Ireland's first. So uh, the two presentations today have been particularly interesting to myself. So um, yeah, we'll just move on to the Q&A section now and put some of our attendees' questions to the panel. Um, but before we do, if you do have any further questions, do continue to send them in and we'll try and answer as many as we can in the time possible. And if you would like your name read out um, alongside your question, just include that in the text as well. So um, for the first question, I'll actually field one um, to both our panelists, if that's OK. Uh, and it's from myself. So what do you feel is the biggest challenge to establishing a successful garden village in the UK today? Um, and tagged onto that, how have you or how would you recommend to overcome these challenges? And um, Jane, I think uh, if possible, if I could field it to you first, and then we'll go to Karen. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's a that's a really interesting question because there are, I would say, there are a number of challenges um, at each stage um, in terms of delivery. And I think the biggest one for me is how do you deliver. Uh, the vision and principles and I know Karen sort of touched on this and it's something that that uh, is, is is the same across the board how do you deliver a garden village with um, those vision and principles um, with the current situation that we're in uh, and with us not being able to um, fund or, or how do you capture that you know, that land value uplift and to actually deliver on all those things that we that we have set out that we would like to see in a garden village and that's the biggest challenge to be honest with you uh, and that's the reason why we are moved where we were very pleased to get the funding for development corporation because that will enable us to explore that mechanism uh, that instrument to be able to deliver uh, everything that makes up a garden village. Yeah, I, I very much agree with Jane on that one. Um, certainly, because we're at a slightly earlier stage, I think our initial challenge is, is, is convincing an inspector that, that the garden village is deliverable. Um, so, so the approach that we've taken is that we're not relying on it um, for our housing numbers. Um, we have a very strong housing land supply um, in the district, which we're expecting to continue throughout the plan period. So it's very much about setting the marker in this local plan. and and then through plan review, going through some of the steps that Carlisle have, have done uh, to be able to add the detail and add the funding streams in so that by the time we get to the point that the garden village is expected to come online, we'll have a lot of that evidence in place to be able to give much more detail around viability. Having said that, we do know we're going to have to um, be able to demonstrate viability to um, an inspector uh, next year. Uh, mm. So that's something that we're working on at the moment in terms of having a very um, sort of uh, bespoke uh, viability model run for the garden village. Uh, and I think that's possibly something that maybe doesn't always come across clearly at examinations is that garden villages um, do run to a very different sort of financial model. And sometimes that's not clear. And, and so we're trying to work out the best way of, of getting that message across to the inspector at the moment. Yeah, and we are also meeting up with the inspectorate because our local plan which will be focused on the garden village we know that those issues will be tested and we really need uh, you know many years ago uh, you would have had a structure plan that would have set the strategic approach to delivering development of this scale and for the for a period of time we don't have that anymore so how do we uh, get that over to um, the inspector about this this issue about delivering something which is 30 40 years in 
you know, it's going to take well beyond even two plan periods in many ways. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thanks so much for both those answers. Um, so the next question actually comes in from one of the attendees, um, Luke Atherton. He's a planner at Mott Mac Mac MacDonald and he has asked, regarding St Cuthbert's Garden Village, how are the council advocating good design and will there be an opportunity for self-builds and progressive and engaging architecture? Absolutely. Uh, you know, design and uh, uh, is is a really important uh, principle that we've set. So, having good design, vernacular design, um, modern design, uh, and actually, as part of the uh, uh, town's deal, we've got funding for an initiative called Start with the Park, which we're working with the Landscape Institute in terms of designing uh, part of that park area. So, getting there quickly in terms of designing the um, uh, the, the park area, but also then we've got our SPD that's just been approved, which sets those design principles very clearly as to what we would expect to see in the garden village. But I know having, you know, um, ex had experience of delivering a new um, t new development uh, of sort of um, medium size, that it's very difficult to maintain the design principles throughout the whole period of development so it's something that we're going to have to keep uh, set good strong principles to start which will then be developed as uh, over the 30 year delivery period excellent thanks so much um another question in from one of the attendees um is it possible to deliver a garden village without public support or significant infrastructure funding um and i'll pass that one to karen first of all if that's okay I think it's it's a, it's a challenge to do it that way around. Um, I mean, certainly that that's something that we're we're looking to um, introduce. Um, but it's, it's 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 a timing issue, isn't it? That to be able to bid for funding, you you do need a certain amount of information to be able to convince um, in a submission that, that that your submission is worthwhile of, of of having the funding for. So it's a bit of a, a bit of a chicken and egg situation. So we're we're hopeful now that we've got the the principles of the garden village to such an, at such a point, and we've got so much um, notable support for what we're doing, and we've got the, the the very detailed evidence base that actually in the future, should the funding streams come on board, that we would be in a very strong position to, to bid for funding. Um, so I mean certainly like for example a station. Um, we, we've got all of the right technical assessments in place to be able to bid for new stations fund when that, that comes online. So that's certainly something that we'd be looking to do in the future. Um, but yeah, it, it would be a challenge otherwise. Excellent, thank you. Um, and I know we're quite tight on time, so if I could field one final question, and it'll be to both of you, Jane first, if that's okay, and then on to Karen. And that question is, how will the garden, garden villages be managed upon completion to ensure that the uh, garden city principles and design of the area are maintained? Um, Jane first, if that would be okay, thank you. Yeah, we're, we're exploring what we can do in terms of uh, uh, managing the, um, particularly the um, green spaces, uh, the blue infrastructure. How do we manage that? And so we've been uh, we've been going to places like Bourneville, for instance, where who have a very uh, good management structure, um, and that's the sort of thing that we would be looking up. So uh, so we will be exploring that, and you know, exploring the ideas like setting up our own. Um, trust or company that will enable the garden village to be um, uh, support managed in the way that we would expect it to be. Yeah, we're, we're very much along the same lines because we're at a slightly earlier stage. We, we, we haven't had as many detailed conversations around this, but certainly we would. It, it wouldn't be something the council would be wishing to take on, as has traditionally been the case. So we'd be looking to introduce um, yeah, trust or organisation or whatever uh, works best for Bassett Law uh, to make sure that that quality of public assets, um, not necessarily just the green blue infrastructure, but maybe community facilities as well, um, is maintained in the long term. Excellent, thank you. Um, I know, as I said, living in a garden village myself, that sort of 
stewardship, long-term management and maintenance. It's so important, but if you do crack it and you crack it well, the um, social infrastructure there that's embedded within the place is actually an attraction in itself. So um, always a difficult one to crack, but if done successfully, um, just adds to the, the allure and the attraction of the garden village itself. So um, apologies that we weren't able to get through everyone's questions there. Um, I know we're on a bit of a tight time frame, but hopefully what we'll do is pass the outstanding questions on to our panel of speakers who will um, have a look at them and see whether they can come back um, and email you answers afterwards if possible. Um, but unfortunately, we'll have to move on to the next stage then. So without further ado, if I could hand across to our TPI president for 2021, Wei Yang, for reflection on today's webinar session. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Hi. Good afternoon. Hi. It's my great pleasure to visit the two proposed garden communities uh, in Northwest and East Midlands. Thank you for, Jane and Karen, your fantastic uh, introduction. I think it's really inspiring to hear how we have using the best principles like uh, healthy places, natural-led development, and also well-connected places. I think all these fantastic um, principles are being applied in our garden communities. I'm really uh, encouraged by that. I think the most encouraging thing for me actually are the considerations on the uh, long-term thinking of planning this garden community and also the determination from our councils to think about using plan-led approach to plan for these sustainable uh, garden communities for the future generations. And also, I think we are using lots of creative ideas to think how, to, how we can relate, uh, relate uh, our current thinking with the uh, constraints we have and how to create a vision with shared, uh, with, uh, shared with our stakeholders. And then actually using this as a strength to attract uh, further funding and support from the government. So I really see all these uh, highly innovative ideas uh, generated from these proposals. So really just want to say congratulations. And I hope um, this is a, it's a long process, but I, I think actually we set a very strong foundation in early days that would help for the future um, delivery and the maturing of the uh, garden community. If I just may uh, use, I think one of my earlier uh, presidential visit went to Lechworth. And then I think something uh, what I heard from Lechworth, I really want to uh, re-emphasize is the essence of garden community model is a social community and the economic model. So it's how we can build this social infrastructure in a much stronger way. Maybe not only community facilities, but also how we can organize social enterprise and the charities for them to be very active in our community. I think maybe it's another next, next level we could consider uh, in the delivery stage. So I really look forward to hearing more about uh, the progress of our garden communities. Thank you very much for your presentation and thank you for Ryan and Ian uh, chairing today's presentation. I hope I can visit uh, in, uh, in in real place actually <laughs> sometime later. I've been to Clive before, so look forward to go back again and go to um, uh, East Midland as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Wei. Um, I don't have a, a, a lot more to, to add to that. Thank you everyone for, for joining us. Um, and thank you to, to, to Jane and to Karen for their for their presentations and for Ryan for chairing the discussions. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be uh, on a webinar like this where, um, especially with something like Garden Villages, where you get to see uh, planning and planners uh, kind of driving forward a change rather than sometimes, uh, as you might, might see in the press, sort of a reactionary to, to wider forces. It's really good to see creativity and, and, and genuine forward planning. Uh, which we can all get excited about. Um, I think if um, they're working behind the background, is, uh, is still there. I think that's probably the, the presentation drawn to an end. Thanks very much.